Okay, we'll get going. So welcome everyone tonight. Uh, tonight we've got Lane Seward. He's a biologist for the Alberta Conservation Association, and he's worked quite a bit with this habitat project. I'm Greg Stamp with Stamp Seeds. Um, yeah, welcome to this, this event. This is the last of our series, and you can find this on YouTube afterwards if you want to share it with someone or take a look later. I've got a few slides and I'll turn it over to Lane. So if you don't know who we are, uh, we're located at Enchant, Alberta, yeah, in Southern Alberta, mainly an irrigation farm and seed production is our, our main business, seed production and sales. So this is kind of what we sell, what we grow and, and what we do. Uh, myself there on the left, I'm Greg. And we got Cody here, who's our finance guy, Nathan, our farm manager and Matthew, who does cleaning and construction projects and some finance and I take care of seed sales and marketing for our farm. Uh, just a couple overhead pictures because I wasn't sure if actually Lane probably didn't have pictures or these pictures specifically. So I thought I'd throw a couple of them in. Um, you know, this is, you know, seed canola production, you know, inside some of these tree rows around the outside edges of some pivots, uh, you know, some maybe some non-irrigated zones, uh, some irrigation canals going through but also some other areas in between that are filled in with uh, some projects and some just natural grassland areas. And here's a picture of some tree planting or hedge planting. And then just an overhead shot of over time. Uh, this is just, I think off of Google Maps, I actually took this because it was pretty simple to find that, but kind of prior to the project. So 06, uh, kind of midway uh, and then you know, close to current. And, you know, every year is a little different. Sometimes you get a wet year that causes more issues within fields or a dry year where you don't see as much. And I think this is kind of in the middle of some of those dry years here because you don't see as, as much going on in the fields as, as later on. And just kind of a shot from, you know, this is near Enchant, kind of a shot of the Enchant Cemetery here, but you can see a few of these different zones and edges of fields edges of field here and down here and around. So you can just see kind of some of the different things uh, for an overhead visual of what Lane's gonna talk about here tonight. That's all I have. Yeah, I don't have very much. So <laughs> I'm going to uh, exit this and switch it over to make Lane a host. Okay, is it, I'll try share my screen here. Oh. Yeah, I just made you host. All right. So you should be able to hit share. Oh yeah, there it's going. Okay, I'll try and get this going. Oh, hey, can you see my screen? You are good. Okay. Okay. Well, while I'm presenting here, Greg, if you want to jump in and, and talk too. Yeah. Oh, and I should say, you feel free to type questions in the chat or, you know, if it's, if it's a real, I mean, it's a small group here. So feel free to, I think, jump in too, if there's something pertinent to that slide that you want to get in on, if you'd rather verbally say it, go for it or put it in the chat, or we'll have a few time for some questions at the end too, but yeah, anyway, works. Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, I'm here today to present to you on the Enchant project. Uh, we called this uh, Strong Farmlands and Thriving Habitat. When I'm presenting, if you have any questions or would like to discuss anything, uh, please speak up throughout the, the presentation. Um, I find these online presentations very hard to do without feedback. Uh, so please join in. <laughs> in terms of the presentation, I wasn't 100% sure who would be sitting on the presentation. Uh, so I kept things fairly general. So if you'd like some more specific details, uh, please let me know. And I'll try to provide you uh, some more information. Um, so a little background on myself. Uh, my name is uh, Lane Seward. I'm a senior biologist with the Alberta Conservation Association. Uh, I've been with ACA for over 10 years, working mostly in the uh, upland game bird uh, habitat programs. Uh, I grew up in a small town in Southern Alberta. I have a farming background. And when I'm not working at ACA, I'm a fourth generation farmer, uh, farming along with my two brothers and my dad. 
just a little background on Alberta Conservation Association. It was formed in 1997. It is a not-for-profit non-government organization that gets its funding from levies put on hunting and fishing licenses. We are considered a delegated administrative organization for the government that operates under a memorandum of understanding. Approximately $14 million per year is generated. And these funds are funneled back into four main program areas, wildlife, fisheries, land management, and a communication outreach program. Um, a few examples of some of the projects uh, under the wildlife program include monitoring wildlife populations, including species at risk, working with ranchers and farmers to improve wildlife habitat and running the provincial pheasant release program. The fisheries program monitors fish populations and their distributions, aerates a number of lakes across the province and stocks a number of lakes to enhance fishing opportunity. Uh, additionally, AC has about 30,000 acres of land that is managed by our land management program for Albertans to access and enjoy. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Alberta Conservation Association, please visit our website at www.ab/conservation.com. So I work with agriculture producers. Um, in Alberta alone, approximately one third of the land base is used for agriculture. This impacts 52 million acres in which 26 million acres is cultivated cropland. With a large land base that is involved in agriculture, the impacts of agriculture can be significant for wildlife. So knowing this at ACA, what we wanted to do is find a farm that we could work with, with intentions of developing a demonstration farm that could showcase some of the habitat enhancements that can be done for wildlife in an agricultural setting. As an organization, we wanted to monitor and increase our knowledge of both the effectiveness of the enhancements and the responses of wildlife to the enhancements. After looking at a number of farms, we we're fortunate enough to get introduced to the Stamps and the Hagens families. They had already formed a partnership and had a good start in some habitat enhancements at what we would, at what we would call the Enchant Farm which is located near Enchant, Alberta. Collectively, I agreed to work together as a group on the Enchant farm. The red, the red outline here outlines the perimeter of the farm. Uh, the farm is approximately 1,466 acres with 867 acres under pivot irrigation. The goals that we're trying to accomplish at the Enchant farm include um, trialing habitat improvements that modern and modern game management to create vibrant upland game bird densities on a modern farm to maintain the functionality of a profitable farming operation in Alberta to monitor biodiversity and wildlife populations in response to changes on the farm to connect with the egg sector and to show others what we have learned. To start out, each year we look at the farm and develop a habitat plan. This is an example of this year's plan. We use the yearly plan as a template to implement the habitat enhancements, and then we evaluate them to the year and the years following. As you can see this year, we have a large number of shrub plantings planned, including planting some dogwood shrubs in specific spots around the farm, some will stakes that we harvested during the winter to plant around some of the wetlands. There are some saline soils that have foxtail issues that we're going to trial different seed blends and see if we are able to develop some permanent cover. We're also planting some corn to provide additional cover, food, um, and overwintering habitat on the farm. Over the past few years, we've been able to test a number of different habitat enhancements. These include habitat seed trials and evaluating different planting methods, testing perennial and annual habitat blends, seed blends, uh, planting shrubs and evaluating different planting maintenance and methods, uh, planting spruce tree pods, evaluation of partridge and pheasant feeders and their different designs, uh, wetland developments, um, the conversion of, non of marginal or non-productive cropland into habitat. Um, a good example is saline soils and the juxtaposition of different habitat enhancements in relation to each other to create uh, optimal habitat. 
So to start, I'll talk about the habitat seed trials. We evaluated a number of different seed varieties by initially running trial plots in the trial plots. In the United States, uh, Pheasants Forever has done a great job of developing numerous habitat seed blends that are available to producers. However, we we're unable to get any of those seed blends into Canada. And some of the seeds that they use in the States aren't approved for use in Canada. So to develop our own blends, we looked at characteristics of the plants in the trials to evaluate their effectiveness for habitat plantings. Characteristics that we looked at included uh, germination success. Um, so whether we, were, we could get the stuff to grow, vertical structure, how tall it grew, flowering, um, if it de developed any seeds and uh, particular seeds that could be used for food for wildlife, um, whether it was a perennial or an annual, uh, the stem ca characteristics, so whether it was multi-stemmed or single-stemmed, uh, how much canopy cover it had, and how easy it was to manage. Um, was it something that we could mow or we could use sprays to um, control weeds or control the, the plant itself? Based upon what we found with the trial plots, we decided to try and develop seed blends that serve four different purposes. The first was a brood rearing blend that would attract pollinators and insects, which would benefit upland game birds when they were raising chicks. We wanted this blend to be flowering as long as possible, provide good canopy cover, have low stem densities and broad leaves. The second was a nesting blend that would provide sufficient nesting habitat for upland game birds or any ground nesting bird. The nesting blends, we wanted to be perennial, so we weren't seeding them in the spring when the birds are trying to nest. We wanted them to have enough structure that they would leave residual cover over the winter and into the spring and provide some vertical structure. We wanted a winter habitat blend that would provide good vertical structure and thermal cover that mim mimicked a cattail marsh, and we wanted it to have some kind of food source. The saline soils blend uh, we wanted to have, we wanted to get salt tolerant plants that would we would hope be able to compete with weeds such as foxtail and kochia. Here's some examples of some of the blends that we have planted on the farm. We have found that having perennial blends are the most realistic because of the effort and the cost required to plant uh, blends each year. Uh, we tried annuals in it. It takes a lot of time and effort when, you, when you're constantly planting them each year. We also found that when you com combine a number of different types of plants into the blends, it virtually eliminates your ability to use chemicals to control weeds. So soil preparation and seed timing are very important when planting these blends. Also, before they become fully established, you have to be prepared to mow the areas where they have been seeded to reduce competition from weeds and allow the seeds and plants to grow. We've also just re recently trialed planting a blend that has nitrogen fixing legumes uh, mixed with different grasses. Uh, the premise behind, the, behind this is that for the first couple of years when the uh, blend is established and the nitrogen fixing legumes will dominate. As time goes by, they will feed the grasses and eventually this will lead to the grasses taking over until the soil becomes depleted of nitrogen, which will allow the legumes to once again take over. Um, so we're gonna try that and see see how it works. Um, as mentioned, there are a large number of shrub plantings on the farm. Shrub plantings are an all-encompassing habitat enhancement. They provide a source of food if you plant berry-bearing shrubs. They provide vertical structure, provide security and thermal cover for wildlife. They're one of the first plants to start flowering in the spring and they attract pollinators and insects. A well-designed shelter belt can help farming operation or operations by aiding in moisture retention, reducing or preventing erosion, creating microclimates, fixing nitrogen, trapping snow, and blocking wind. However, the downside of shrub plantings is that they are a big investment both financially and in terms of time with keeping the maintenance and the upkeep. On this map, the brown areas show where the shrub plantings are. So this is the Enchant Farm. There's approximately 60 linear cloners of shelter belts planted. Species planted include uh, buffalo berry, sea buckthorn, hawthorn, saskatoon, carragana, wolf willow, wild rose, cranberry, 
sandbar willow, choke cherry, and spruce. Generally on the farm, we try to plant low growing shrubs so that they don't interfere with the pivots or encourage nesting from magpies or crows. Lane, did you say 60, 60 kilometers or 16? 60, so 60 yeah. linear kilometers, yeah. yeah. So I think there's estimated about 120,000 shrubs planted. Um, that's an estimate, but um, so we'll, we have trialed a number of different planting te techniques, including hand planting, using a tree planter, and using a bobcat with an auger bit to dig holes for hand planting. We have tried planting shrubs in linear rows, uh, in pods, under irrigation, with drip, drip irrigation, and in dry land. For weed control around the shrubs, we have tried mowing, disking, uh, hand pulling, hoeing, laying cocoa discs around the, the base of the shrubs, laying black fabric mulch like shown above and using chemical controls like um, spreading a granular casser on uh, in the fall. Uh, some of the key findings we discovered when uh, shrub planting, um, site preparation is key. Black dist or deeply worked soils is best that are free from um, residual grass and um, I guess vegetation. The most efficient way to plant shrubs is with a tree planter. Uh, with the tree planter we have that uh, was pictured earlier there, we can plant up to eight linear kilometers uh, shrubs per day. The type of shrub species does matter. Um, certain species do better than others. Um, as you can see from the graph above, sea buckthorn, wolf willow, buffleberry, carragana, and hawthorn have all done well. Um, when you plant shrubs, you have to plan on controlling the weeds for at least five years around the shrubs. Mowing, uh, hand weeding, disking, and chemical control all work. After about five years, the, the shrubs get, they're big enough and they get a good enough root established um, that they can usually outcompete most of the grasses or anything else that's growing around them. Um, this might be a little, this is probably rather intuitive, but watering increases survival rate, enhances growth. We either plant shrubs so that the end gun on the pivot will hit them. Uh, we lay drip irrigation or plan on watering them by hand for the first few years. The black mulch that is shown. Oh, go ahead. Uh, these charts are, is this from like a specific, like your research here, or is this just in general Western Canada type of research? research? Uh, this is ones, these charts are from um, plantings that we've done not at the Enchant Farm, but kind of around okay. too. Yeah, some of these are the Enchant Farm, but some of it's data taken from other spots too. Okay, thanks. So um, the black mulch that is shown in the previous slide that is six feet across is one of the uh, best methods to control weeds and promote shrub growth. Um, so as mentioned, this uh, six feet, six foot piece of black mulch is called lumite um, and it's a woven fabric that is a weed barrier. Uh, it allows moisture to pe penetrate while reflecting sunlight. Um, it helps to create a moist microclimate under the mulch that encourages shrub growth. It is a big investment when you originally plant the shrub, but it pays over the next five years by saving time from weeding and watering. So anytime we plant shrubs as an organization, we try and lay this lumite down to, to make things a little bit easier. So I'll talk a little bit about wetland development. See, I, I had some aerial photos too, Greg. <laughs> um, as you can see from the map, the Enchant Farm has a number of natural occurring wetlands and wetlands that have been uh, constructed. The benefit of wetland systems includes storing and filtering nutrients, buffering erosion, assisting with water management. Um, we consider them biodiversity hotspots. They provide excellent habitat and thermal cover for wildlife. Um, and there's also been some findings that there can be up to, there can be increased crop production for up to 75 meters um, from the edge of a wet wetland. So I, can you see my mouse? So, so this photo is taken about four years apart where you can see the cattail development on this wetland for reference. Um, you can see the bales in the middle of the wetland. So where my mouse is here, um, that's the bales that are over here. When we first started working at the Enchant Farm, 
uh, we released ring neck pheasants with radio transmitters so we could track them. Um, surprisingly, most of the radio collared pheasants left the farm. And we had to attach our telemetry gear to an airplane to go find them. What we found is that the pheasants walked up to 15 linear kilometers from the farm and almost all the ones we monitored spent the winter in large cattail complexes. This reinforced the importance of, wetland, of wetlands for wildlife. When we construct wetlands on the farm, we tried to maintain depths that didn't exceed 30 inches, and we tried to allow water levels to fluctuate as they would naturally through the season to encourage cattail growth. Uh, wetlands and water management. In the spring of 2018, at the Enchant Farm, there was excessive runoff from the spring melt. Uh, Greg probably remembers this. <laughs> at the farm, the wetlands provided stamps with the ability to manage the standing water in the crop cropland, so they weren't impacted as much and were able to get on the land earlier and farm it. So planning habitat in the landscape. When we plan, ha plan habitat plantings on the farm, we tried to keep in mind what we have dubbed as a habitat sandwich, which is essentially trying to keep nesting strips, brood rearing strips, and winter cover strips in close proximity to one another. The concept behind this is to minimize the amount of distance and energy expenditures that wildlife have to spend going to these different habitat types. This should increase survival and recruitment or reproduction on the farm. So here's an example of a habitat sandwich uh, out at Enchamp. There are residual grasses on the far left, a brood mix in the middle, and on the right, there's winter habitat that's uh, it's still growing. So here's another example of the habitat sandwich with a brood mix in the middle and nesting strips located on either side. Okay, this photo is along a field margin with the cropland on the right, some corn that we planted for a winter habitat food mix in the center with shelter pelts and a brood mix on the far left. Lastly, this is another example of corn planted for winter shelter or food along one of the shelter belts. On the other side of the shelter belt, which you can't see, um, is a strip of residual grass and then the cropland starts on the other side of that. So the wildlife on the farm. As part of the monitoring of the farm, we survey what it we survey what wildlife is on the farm uh, and certain species responses to the habitat enhancements that have been implemented. Every spring on the farm, we conduct point count surveys to monitor biodiversity. To date, we have identified 91 species. 15 of the 91 are classified as a species at risk on either the provincial or federal level. This includes three species that are threatened that may be at risk and 12 with special concern that are sensitive species. To help evaluate the different habitat enhancements we have completed at the farm, we're monitoring gray partridge populations and their distribution. Gray partridge are an introduced species that have been in Alberta for over 100 years. Globally, the population numbers are on a decline. In Alberta, gray partridge are a sought after game bird that are well adapted to agricultural landscapes. Gray partridge are a species whose population is quite cyclic, meaning that they have a high reproductive rate, but they also die off quite easily. In the springtime, gray partridge are quite territorial and the males will fight for prime territory. Given their territorial tendencies, uh, small range sizes, and their natural currents, uh, gray partridge were a good species for us to monitor to see how they react to our habitat enhancements. In order to get a better of idea of gray partridge numbers and locations on the farm, every spring and fall, we do a complete survey of the farm using a combination of hunting dogs and trucks to get a count of the number, to get a complete count of the number of gray partridges on the farm. So the above graph shows the partridge densities. I guess the above graphs. Um, the graph on the left shows the spring partridge pair density and the graph on the right shows the fall partridge uh, density. We also survey some control sites in the media area, which is agricultural land that doesn't have enhancements on it. Uh, generally speaking, the numbers in the Enchant Farm 
greatly exceed the numbers on the control sites each year um, that we surveyed them. Um, I didn't put the graphs of the control site densities because we didn't consistently <laughs> monitor them every year. So it doesn't make such a nice, nice graph. Um, if you notice the peak densities in 2017, at this point, the farm has arguably one of the highest partridge densities in North America. Then during the 2017-2018 uh, winter, we had an unseasonably cold winter with high snow accumulation. Numbers came from the high, the, the numbers came down from the high and have been coming down since. We're still trying to figure out why they are still coming down or if it's just part of the cyclic nature of partridge populations. Hopefully soon, <laughs> their numbers will start to increase. This heat map shows the partridge locations on the farm taken over the past five years in the spring. It is interesting to note the consistency and where the partridge are located across the farm. Note that they aren't in the cropland much, but like to be in the field margins. Uh, this heat map shows the fall partridge survey locations. Uh, this is over the last four years. When we complete the fall, surveys, the partridges are grouped in large coveys, unlike the spring where they are grouped in pairs. Because of the large groups, it makes this map look less densely populated than the spring map, but there are actually more partridge in the fall. Um, they're just in bigger groups, so there's less detections. In order to better understand the habitat use in the farm, we completed resource selection function modeling to see if the partridges have a preference specific habitats on the farm. To complete the RSF analysis, the habitat types in the farm were divided into the following categories. Grassland, cropland, woody vegetation, which that included the shrub rows and the spruce plantings, wetlands and developed areas. We also looked at the proximity effects or distance to other habitat types, feeders, roads, uh, nearest partridge pairs or groups, and the crop stubble type of the nearest field. Our initial results suggest you're more likely to find a partridge in the habitat over the cropland. And when I say habitat, I mean anything that's not the cropland. Um, also, the partridge had a very strong preference for shelter belts and edge habitat. If you look at the graph on the right, once you get about 100 meters from the shelter belts, the chances of seeing a partridge uh, decreased to almost zero. Because of Partridge's strong preference for the shelter belts, we looked more closely at the shelter belt characteristics on the farm. We, pr we predicted that shelter belts were two meters in height and three to five row were ideal for Partridge's. Uh, one other thing that we found that kind of surprised us, um, for one of the years, the density of the wetlands on the farm had a negative impact or association with uh, where the Partridge's were on the farm. So going forward, we're going to continue to trial different habitat treatments on the farm and monitor wild res life responses to the treatments. In addition, we have been collecting data for a few years now and are getting a fairly large data set. We are working on the analysis of the data and hopefully we'll be publishing some reports on our findings. Uh, some future directions. I get a little theoretical here, but I wanted to bring this up. So as biologists, when we talk about wildlife habitat with people, one thing that no one has been able to do yet is put a monetary va value on what wildlife habitat is worth. When you have a wetland on your land, what is it worth? Does it cost you money to have it on your land? If you aren't farming through it and you have to farm around it, it causes a loss of time, um, possible increased inputs from farming around it, and you aren't harvesting any crop from land where that wetland is. So is there any value in having that wetland with wildlife on your land? Does the halo effect from increased water table going out in the cropland offset the loss of production of the wetland? Um, if you have places on your land that are marginal soils that you don't grow good crops, is it worth the inputs of seed, fertilizer, and spray to get very little return? Um, are you better off turning that land into wildlife habitat? These are all questions that as biologists we like to know the answers to. And as farmers, it would help to make better informed decisions on whether to implement habitat enhancements on your land. So hopefully in the future, we can find a way to answer some of these questions. That's 
the end of it. If there's any questions at all. <laughs> Thanks. I'll make a comment on your last slide there because it was just something that came to my mind. We rent some other land, not this land, but some other land. And we were farming through some lower spots under irrigation, under a pivot. And it's rented land, so we're paying rent on that essentially. But we were farming through these spots and seeding it and getting through it. But throughout the season, you get a big rainstorm or pivot irrigation would eventually kind of fill those areas up. And you wouldn't really harvest any crop like around the edges. Yeah, but through there, you know, we're seeding through there and you just you're spending X dollars per acre on inputs and going through there and you're not harvesting anything off from it. So we actually put in a, a blend of, you know, something to get established in there, but some alfalfa in there as well to try and maybe minimize that area on that field. But so we're not spending money on that area in that field over the yeah. remainder of the time. So that's something we did on some land that we just it didn't make sense to farm through. Yeah, and I think that's a lot of farmer, a lot, I think a, a lot of farmers face that decision. Uh, I know on our land, we have it too. And a lot of the, the farmers that we work with as an organization, um, that's where they want to do habitat. They'll have us out and they say, you know, I try to farm this, you know, every year and two out of 10 years, I get to cut a crop out here and it's, it's just costing me money. So they say, well, let's, let, what can we do for habitat? And so that's where we come out and try and try and figure out what we can do to to get some wildlife on that on that area sure yeah that makes sense um i think we'll see more of that as time goes on actually more people thinking about that a little bit more um one one question uh so any native species on your grass blend lists like so so some of the tame species versus native is there some good or bad that you've seen with using native species versus not well, in, in general, um, I would say native species are, are better to plant. Um, on the farms here, they're also quite expensive to plant though too. Um, when we do native grass reclamations and stuff like that, it's quite expensive. Um, on the farm here, we're looking at um, farmland, I'll, I'll call it a disturbed landscape. Um, so we're not overly concerned about using native or non-native species um in a farm landscape we're, we're just trying to find ones that have characteristics that would benefit the wildlife so um as i mentioned depending on what you're looking for stuff that's flowering uh perennial um some stuff that grows grows tall um all that stuff so, so some of the natives they could some of the uh, tame species be almost better in some situations like in this in this already disturbed situation possibly some tame could be as good or better yeah, um, <laughs> on the farm here, one thing that we have found is, uh, and, and Greg, you can attest this to too. Um, when we first started, we were trying a whole bunch of different blends. And because we were putting so much into the blend, um, we couldn't spray it. Because when we, because sprays are fairly specific. And if you start putting in a whole bunch of different species, you start killing certain parts of your blend. And so um, it wasn't, it was hard to control weeds on the farm. And so what we uh, figured out actually that has been working really well is Roundup Ready Corn has been working good. It, it grows really well. Um, it provides good vertical structure. Um, it's an excellent food source. It'll stay standing over all winter. And it, um, you can control the weeds around there too, which um, makes the farmers happy too. So yeah, and that, that hybrid that that has been used is is a pretty um uh, like that's a longer season one it's one of the longer season ones that available actually in or that's ever used in western canada actually so yeah. just out of fyi <laughs> um so it's yeah so it's kind of kind of interesting on that variety um another comment do you notice a change in insect pressure in those fields versus other fields without hab habitat enhancement um yeah, comment first, Lane, because I. Yeah, so I talked to um, I've talked to Nathan about this a bit, and anecdotally, uh, Nathan has has said that he thinks they're using less pesticides um, on the on the Enchan farm um, compared to some of the other farms that you're farming. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure if it's because we're creating a better balance of good and bad insects or 
or how that's working. But yeah, that's that's something. Is, are those birds eating? Like, are they eating some small insects? Like, is that part of it? That you know? Yeah, when they're so when they're when uh, partridge have chicks or pheasants have chicks, uh, they're in the first few phases of, of or the first few weeks of their life. Um, that's pretty much all they feed on is insects. So having a good insect population is is crucial for their their survival and growth. Well, I would say like, you know, some insects that on parts of our farm that we may have to may may have to spray for in season could be uh, ligus bugs, you know, uh, in, uh, um, you know, cabbage seed pod weevil, things like that. But but ligus bug is a concern for some crops, grasshoppers, we've we've had to deal with that in flax and some crops, but not on this farm more on farms that border some real dry dry land uh, along some coolies but uh, I don't think we've had to spray for grasshoppers here at this place that I can think of um, what else yeah there's, there's not a lot of insecticide spraying that happens but there is times but here yeah I, I think you're right there is less times that we are needing to deal with anything on this place versus others um Oh, I, I had a comment from a friend actually prior to the presentation. Um, he was wondering, is there any research papers or is there anything published based on this or something similar that, you know, he could go look at or just see how yep. it's impacting things? Yeah, so there's quite a few um, uh, peer reviewed articles published on, on this type of stuff. Um, over in the UK, um, there, there's quite a few farms that are similar to this farm. Um, that have been doing this for a number of years um, and they have some really good studies over there that you can you can go look at is there so, much in in the plain like in the in western canada or no not not in canada um, not that i'm aware of there's this is there's a, down in the states there's a project going on down there um i can't remember the name of it off the top of my head oh. but uh of, okay. of this type i don't know of a lot okay if, if you if you do think of it he might maybe pass it along to me because he's involved yep. in some policy type stuff and, and he was quite curious. So, okay. um, yeah. How, how do you decide where to put shrubs like on in, 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 like, obviously it's because where the irrigation is in this area, but is there a specific plan you have in mind for shrubs in general or? Yeah. So when we're, when we go out to look at someone's uh, farm or um, some place where someone wants to do habitat, um, there's a couple things we think about. So what we try and do is we try and look and see what's, what they already have there. Um, so if they already have a wetland or, you know, some, some alfalfa or some trees somewhere else, we try and plan so that it's kind of, it all kind of feeds into each other. Um, and then one of the things that in Southern Alberta that, you know, plays a big, big part of it is, is, uh, the wind, um, it gets so windy down here. So when we, we think about designing shelter belts and everything um, we try to take in consideration the wind and then when we plant or when we plant them we try and put so um, I don't know if you saw that I put caragannus as one of the um, species in in the list um, a lot of people don't like caragannus but they grow really well and they work really good to put on the west side of a shelter belt to stop all the wind and as that they help to it helps to um create these microclimates where we can put a bunch of different other shrub varieties on the downward wind side and it, it helps retain moisture and they fix nitrogen. Um, so that's one of the things we look at. Um, and then depending on people's equipment too, we always, if the, if it's an active farm, um, we try and plan it so that, you know, it's not interfering with your equipment too much either. If you have, you know, 120 foot sprayer, you don't want to leave yourself, you know, hundred foot areas to try and get through and stuff like that. So. Um, yeah, there's a few things we look at, to be honest with you, and it, and it depends on what's there, um, the people's operation, and and what they're looking for with the shelter belts too, the purpose. Okay. Um, how much area is actually needed to do something like like physically? If I said, oh, I've got this 160 acre piece of land, and I've got maybe a little corner over here, a little dip here, like I'm assuming it's you know, to do something small, you might not need very much area really at all, right? I mean, to, to just play a small role, right? Or, yeah. or, do, you, or do you need us five acres to kind of make something happen, you know? Um, well, anything helps. So I, I would say if, if 
you want to do any wildlife habitat at all helps. Um, the bigger the area, probably the better. Um, one of the main things that I guess can kind of help is if you if you can create a connectivity around a farm. So if you can have, um, I guess, essentially these travel corridors, or you can put your habitat so that uh, wildlife has a way to move around, um, that really helps. But uh, we've done, you know, habitat enhancements on, you know, areas that are 10 acres in size. It, there's been places where uh, landowners have come and said, you know, we can't get our equipment in here or we can't, um, we can't farm this area. And so we've, we've put in, you know, a whole bunch of shelter belts or a whole bunch of shrubs in this 10 acres. And um, it's been quite amazing the amount of wildlife that have moved into the, the area where we've just done even small areas. Mm, okay. A uh, comment from Brady, is your association looking for more acres to do things like this on? Yeah, yeah, we always, um, we have a few different program areas um, where we could, we work. So we have, um, we have a multi-star program that works with species at risk that we're, we'll work with uh, ranchers and farmers. Um, we have a, it's called the Habitat Legacy Program that works with, uh, with farmers developing habitat. Um, yeah, there's a few different programs. So yeah, we're always looking for uh, landowners to work with and, and come up with new ideas or, or help people develop ideas too. Um, even if people, um, we have programs that people that will help people with, or sometimes people just want to do it on their own. And so we'll just come out and meet with them and uh, give them some ideas of stuff that they can, can do on their own also. Oh yeah, that's, that's good. So yeah, Brady Lane's info is on the screen there. You can always shoot him an email or, or a call or something. So, yep. Um, Oh, um, your one slide you had uh, partridge or I think it was partridges with a negative response to wetlands. In the one slide, you said they had somewhat of a one year or one time or there was. Yeah, one year uh, when we did our the resource selection function, mm -hmm. um, there was a negative association with wetlands. And that was the only year out of the five years we ran it that we had that. And so uh, not 100% sure. I'm, I'm wondering if it was maybe one of the wet years um where they were trying to get the higher ground or something i'm not sure but yeah so i was thinking maybe they got flooded out and it kind of ruined things <laughs> yeah. um yeah oh and the brood mix can you explain what the brood blend does is it for like the young birds to be able to eat something like, what is that specifically doing for them yeah so the the brood mix is one that um, we try to plant um, that encourages insects to come in. So as I mentioned, when when the baby pheasants or partridges are really little, they, they rely heavily on uh, insects. That's the prime, their primary food source. Um, so the brood mix is, is one that we plant and it's flowering and it has, you know, broad leaves and, and uh, we hope that it will attract insects and um, has low stem density so that the chicks can get in there and, and feed on the insects that this mix brings in. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's kind of all the questions I had written down. Um, I was pretty amazed you said the pheasants would went like almost 15 kilometers to find cattails that one winter that you were kind of tracking them. That's, that's yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah, we learned a lot about uh, site fidelity that year. Um, we were actually really surprised too because um after that year we tried <laughs> different release text techniques to see if we could actually get pheasants to to stick around the site more um and and we did did get it to work a little bit but yeah when they it was actually really surprising in one week um they were traveling yeah quite a few kilometers um it made it hard for us to find them and keep track of them to be honest <laughs> are, are the are the corn stalks doing anything for pheasants for cover like are they mimicking cattails or do you need cattails no the corn's working well okay. um yeah when we started uh planting uh, we started out with the sorghum um and it was it was working pretty good a sorghum millet mix um but what we found is when it when there was heavy snowfalls um it actually it actually pushed down pretty bad and uh didn't keep it didn't, didn't, didn't stay standing um but the corn yeah it it stays standing and it's been working nice um when you go out there right now it's it's still at least up to, up to your head there and and uh yeah the wildlife are using it okay nice 
another question, any issues with chemical drift from farmed acres? No, Brady, we don't drift. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, like that, that, I mean, potentially there, there could be, I suppose, right? If you're doing an insecticide or maybe a herbicide or. Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, I should have mentioned this actually in the presentation I did. So um, what we've done around all the, and when I say we, I mean, Alberta Conservation Association and Stamps and, and Hagen. So I'm not just talking about us, I'm talking about the group of us, but um, we've put a, a seven foot dirt buffer um, around all the cropland. And so essentially that buffer separates the cropland from the from all the habitat. So you have the seven foot buffer to kind of take care of any spray drift and 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 it makes a it's very visual so you can see see where you're going um and then around some of the areas that that are in the field where the wetlands are and stuff like that we've actually put up uh marker poles and and stuff like that so that um you're, you're aware of where the where the boundaries are so i think some of the biggest challenges we've had is if if you've got uh you know people running equipment or managing the equipment operators who don't fully know what's happening with the project. We struggle with that a little bit as it transitioned from, you know, me doing some of the main farming to Nathan as the farm yeah. manager, you know, a number of years ago. And, and so there were some challenges there when that, you know, just knowing exactly what you guys are doing and what the plan is. And then just, yeah. you know, it's just, but just even thinking of spraying, I mean, it's, it's difficult to spray a crop and not trample a crop when you don't have a spot to kind of swing your your boom around properly or you know things like that it, there there definitely is some challenges with with dealing with some of it um but 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 in the end it is quite interesting because you know potentially this is maybe a farmer needs to look at this a little bit closer than than purely a farm from edge to edge on every single acre um, because maybe not every acre is meant to be farmed in the way we're farming so yeah but it's not without its challenges for sure <laughs> yeah well, but, but just you know being having a plan and meeting and knowing what the other person's up to that's that's critical in, in any project like this and and that's where I struggled because it got too busy it got too much and luckily then Nathan was able to help take that on and, and Joe um who, who's helping deal with that as well and make sure things aren't uh, things are happening the way they're supposed to happen on the farming side anyways so yeah yeah so, um another question have you ever considered a full season cover crop on a field or portion of a field uh what kind of effect might this have on wildlife in the area and and possibly even strips in the field right um uh, yeah so there uh, it hasn't been done well actually on the farm there there are strips now um i'm going through uh, actually under pivot on two of the two of the fields there's strips going through um but one of the things that we've started looking into um, is the, the, the intercropping premise. So, um, and trying to figure out a way, um, I, don't, I don't know, Greg, how much, if you guys have had any intercropping talks or anything like that, but planting, you know, multiple or not multiple, but different seed or crops within the same field and then harvest them. And, and for us, that's, that's pretty interesting if we could find a way to do that for wildlife so something where you know you're you're harvesting the top crop but it's leaving a layer underneath that that would benefit wildlife that is after you take the crop top crop off it could it continue to grow or or do something like that so um that's one thing um and we looked at but yeah anytime you can leave we call it permanent cover uh in a field um without having to disturb it, it i mean it's beneficial for wildlife so yeah, I don't know if I, I don't don't know if I really answered that question right. But. <laughs> well, is is there is there I guess is there it's probably beneficial, but yeah, is 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 the value of that worth not farming, right? Because I'm assuming you're you're taking up productive farmland, right? So yeah, yeah, on the on the so on the farm out there, um, essentially you guys are farming under the pivot, um, and you're not farming any of the. The corners so i think it's about 30 acres in each each quarter section mm -hmm. um that essentially is leaving idle and so that that's one area that on this farm on the enchant farm that um all these different brood mixes have been planted in and we're looking at them and 
and it definitely has been benefiting wildlife. And so even on an irrigation system, sometimes um, we wonder if, you know, if there was an opportunity to, uh, you know, take the pivot corners, um, the less productive areas and, and leave that into permanent cover. Um, it would be, it would be really nice. And that I, it's too bad there's not a, a program for that right now, but if there was, I think it would be, it would really benefit wildlife. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I think especially if farmers don't have corner arm irrigations, you, you'd you have people saying, eh, it's not worth farming that dry land corners, maybe let's do something with it that's yep. not cropping. Because <laughs> there are some years where it's so darn dry that it's almost not worth farming them, honestly, uh, yeah. in some situations. Um, and staging is so different too. And your weeds come later when you finally get a rain and then all of a sudden you've, your the corners get over, overtaken by weeds and stuff. So they the dry line corners are a challenge around irrigation. Yeah. Sure. Um, thinking of like intercropping and cover crops and things like that. For us, one challenge is seed production. Anything that's not that crop in there is essentially a, a weed or an off type or something that's in that crop. Uh, so that's, that's a challenge uh, is, does it become a problem in our seed production system for our business? Um, and, and as well with irrigation, like your plant stands are so strong and so aggressive typically on those crops, like say putting a clover in peas or fabas, that crop will smother anything in its way. It, it is just such a strong, you know, the crop is so strong. It is hard to establish anything, even, uh, even if you're planting at the same time, that crop just completely overtakes it. And then herbicides, how do you spray that properly without killing that cover? We try to do some clovers underneath some peas and things like that. I think we could have planted the clovers a little bit earlier than we did because all of a sudden the peas filled in and nothing's going to survive under that, that strong pea canopy. Yeah. Um, so potentially we could look at a little bit more things like that, but there it's not simple. I don't think. No. And that's the thing. It's not, it's not an easy thing to figure out. So. No, no. Um, but, but the poten there is potential and certain crops don't smother quite as bad. Like there are, you know, cereals or you could do different row spacings or, you know, things like that. There, there are potentially some opportunities, but uh, the, the, when, yeah, it's, it's a little bit easier when you could say, okay, this is farming and this is habitat. But when they're kind of both together, it gets challenging <laughs> yep. on that same exact acre. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I agree. So. Well, any other questions anyone wants to ask or in the chat or verbally or, or any last comments lane or. Nope. I just thank you for, for having me. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Lane. I'll, I'll get her up on YouTube on the stamp seeds channel and uh, feel free to share it or, or link it to people that are interested. So. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you everyone. Okay, see you. Thanks.